two weeks ago, I gave an interview. It was a five-minute radio interview. The company that runs the radio show did nothing wrong. The host asked me one question, and she did absolutely nothing wrong. She was doing her job. The question she asked me was if I knew whether or not there could be a possible link between COVID-19 vaccines and cases of heart inflammation that have been reported around the world in young males. In this case, it was 12 young males in Israel. And I've been delving into the literature uh, very deeply because I'm a vaccinologist. My entire research program is based on the development of novel vaccines. My publication record is based on publishing information about vaccines. So I have a lot of expertise in this area. And indeed, I have, along with a large number of collaborators, both within Canada and internationally, have developed some serious concerns about the, the current COVID-19 vaccines. And so I felt that I could express concern and that there might be a possible link between this heart inflammation that's occurring and these COVID-19 vaccines. After I did this interview, five minutes, again, trying to present to a lay audience, it was like a nuclear bomb went off in my world and my life was thrown upside down. And I, I'm sure my life will never be the same again. So within 24 hours, there was a libelous website that was put up using my domain name. A fake Twitter account was developed to slander me. And I've been undergoing daily attacks, either through email, people attempting to call me, uh, and, and definitely in the social media. And I never had a, a presence within the social media until recently when, when I now have a fake social media presence. This has been very hard on me and my family. For the first, uh, I should also mention, I'm experiencing harassment, lots of harassment in the workplace. Now, with that said, I want to point out, I'm from the University of Guelph. The administration of my institution has made it very clear that they are very supportive of me. They uh, honour and respect the, the basic tenet of academic freedom and freedom of speech. So for my institution, I really appreciate that. But there's colleagues of mine who have been harassing me, both in the social media and in the workplace. Uh, it's even gone so far as to have one of the uh, members of the Ontario COVID-19 Science Advisory Committee. Uh, they were actually the first ones to post uh, the link to the slanderous website. Uh, and they have fanned the flames of this smear campaign quite strongly since then. They even went so far as to release confidential medical information about my parents. This is an egregious act. This is a practicing physician. A practicing physician should know that they should not be releasing confidential information about people, medical information in the social realm. So these are the types of things that I've been experiencing over the past couple of weeks. After three days, it was like a walking zombie. I got about one and a half hours of sleep the first several nights. Then I got it together because of my support network. I've got a couple of colleagues locally at my institution who have stood shoulder to shoulder with me. I'm part of the Canadian COVID Care Alliance. This is a group of individuals. In fact, the reason that we exist is sad. We exist because we're like-minded in the sense that we all want to be able to speak openly and freely about the science and medicine underpinning COVID-19. And we don't feel safe to do it anywhere else other than within our own private group where we feel safe. Myself and one other member of that group, our group has grown to 100 members and is still rapidly growing. We're quite new. And only two of us are willing to talk to the media about this group. The others are too afraid for their jobs. They're afraid, they're physicians that are afraid they're going to lose their license to practice and their academics and other professionals who are afraid that they are going to lose their jobs. So what I'm going to talk about uh, right now is exactly why I've been harassed, okay? And so this science that I'm going to talk about very briefly, I don't have much time, so I'm just going to be very brief. Uh, but if you want more information about this, I've written a comprehensive guide for parents so that they can make informed decisions about COVID-19 vaccines when it comes to vaccinating their children. This guide you can find at the website for the Canadian COVID Care Alliance. So that is canadiancovidcarealliance.org. And what happened in this interview? When I was asked if I'm concerned or if I saw potential for a link between heart inflammation and the COVID-19 vaccines, I said I did. And this is why. What we have learned, and, and we've learned this from a, a, a large body of scientific literature. We've also learned this from reports that were submitted by Pfizer themselves to regulatory agencies, one in particular to a regulatory agency in Japan. 
And what we have learned is, I'm very familiar with vaccines, and traditional vaccine technology would tell us that when you put a vaccine into the shoulder, and that's where we get vaccinated with the COVID-19 vaccines, traditional vaccine technology tells us the vaccine would stay on the shoulder. And then what happened is cells from the immune system would come and pick up the spike protein. All these vaccines get our bodies to manufacture the spike protein, right? So cells of the immune system pick up that spike protein, take it to the local draining lymph node, and activate the immune system. That's why often when we get sick or we've been vaccinated, sometimes our lymph nodes swell because that's where our immune response is happening and our B and T cells go throughout the body to look for the virus, okay? So this was an assumption and I accept that at the early on in the pandemic and when we were first rolling out these vaccines, we've had to largely work based on assumptions. But you know what? The scientific literature has exploded over the last 16 months and we understand so much more, okay? And so now we're looking at vaccinating children and it's no longer okay to proceed based on assumptions. And so what we have found is that this assumption about the vaccine remaining in the shoulder does not apply to this novel vaccine technology. It's never been in people before. These messenger RNA vaccines get distributed throughout the whole body. What we have found in fact is that as little as 25% of the dose remains in the shoulder and it traffics all over the body. Also, many of you might have heard of polyethylene glycol because that is one of the components of the vaccine that sometimes people develop anaphylactic shock to, okay? The polyethylene glycol was put in the, this formulation. A lot of people don't realize these lipid nanoparticles, these little bubbles of fat that carry this little blueprint that helps our cells make the spike protein, those lipid nanoparticles were actually originally designed to disperse throughout the body. They were designed to be gene therapy vectors and also carry drug cargo, especially into the brain, where it could be used to treat things like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease and brain cancers. That polyethylene glycol, just so that you know, is designed to help facilitate that spread throughout the body. You get about five-fold greater spread throughout the body with the polyethylene glycol there. Do you know why? Because when the polyethylene glycol is there, it actually helps the lipid nanoparticles bypass the very cells of our immune system that are supposed to pick up the antigen and take it to our lymph nodes. So arguably, by having that polyethylene glycol there, not only are we promoting spread throughout the body, but we may actually be dampening the very functionality of the vaccine that we want. Okay, now a lot of this is speculation, of course. Uh, but what we do know for sure, what is not speculation, is this vaccine spreads throughout the body. What we also know is that proper studies have not been conducted. Remarkably, this is based on a rat study, a study done in rats, and that's appropriate as a starting point, but that should not be the end point. This should have been done in at least two animal models, and remarkably, it hasn't been done in people, and it has not been done at all with the actual vaccine formulation that we are administering to our children. It has not, that, or the actual vaccine formulation has not even been evaluated. What's been evaluated is the lipid nanoparticle technology, but not the vaccine itself. Even when it comes to reproductive studies, when the reproductive studies were done, only female mice were, or female rodents were vaccinated. The males were not. And also what people don't realize, and there was no evidence of any issues with, uh, with fertility. What people don't realize is, a mouse, is these rodents are completely inappropriate models for COVID-19. They don't express the receptor like we do. So of course you're going to see safety in a model like that. It's an inappropriate animal model. So what I'm trying to get out to you here is there, have, there are studies. There, there, short, we were told there, no, there would be no shortcuts. There have been shortcuts. Okay. Now I can understand when in a panic and when we're trying to deal with something that we felt was extremely dangerous, you know, I can understand, again, moving based on assumptions. But what, remember, what I'm focusing on here are children and vaccinating healthy children. Mass vaccination of millions of healthy Canadian children demands that the level of safety associated with this, the assessed safety profile, has to be exceptionally high. Right? We've had 13 Canadians under the age of 20 die in 16 months, with well over 2,500 dying from other causes. Okay? So this is just to put it in perspective. So we really need to focus on the safety here. And then what I just want to point out is this science is backed up by many scientists and many physicians, including one of the inventors of messenger RNA vaccine technology, Dr. Robert Malone. Okay, so this is a genuine concern for children. And where this leads me to is by expressing this, I, my, my career may very well have been destroyed. And I, I don't understand that. I, 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 it's incomprehensible to me that this has happened. Okay, but... As Canadians, we have to ask ourselves, do you want your physicians and scientists, their voices suppressed? 
We're polarized right now. We're polarized in Canada. We have people on both sides. We have to understand we're just as passionate. We feel that we are trying to look after the best interests. We're doing our cost benefit analysis, for example, in my case with children. And I honestly feel that by proceeding with vaccination right now, without conducting the proper safety tests, we may do more harm than good. I'm passionate about that, but I'm respectful of those who hold the opposite opinion. I would ask for the same for myself and my colleagues. We can't suppress open discussion of science and medicine in Canada. It's, it's a hallmark of a democratic society. Okay, and one of the other things I want to point out is I'm here representing uh, physicians, scientists, um, members of the media who feel suppressed, and I've also been asked to represent some politicians who uh, approached me privately who feel that their jobs are at risk, and MP Derek Sloan can certainly attest to what happens if you speak up too much uh, about, you know, trying to have open discussions. Okay, so I want to end here, but I want to point out that uh, Dr. Patrick Phillips is going to be speaking in a few minutes. And I want you to know that uh, he's one physician, but he represents hundreds, all right? I have been contacted by hundreds of physicians who uh, support his viewpoint, and he is going to present with you some things that will allow us to uh, safely pause these vaccines. Because somebody like Patrick Phillip and, uh, Phillips and his colleagues have effective strategies for preventing and treating COVID-19 that would allow us to take a pause on these vaccines, okay? So right now, I don't recognize the country that I was born into, and I would simply ask all Canadians, please, right? I, I simply want us to learn to respect one another again. Thank you very much.